Hello, welcome back for our next video on loop structures in Java. Um, before I begin, I just want to say thanks for watching and please feel free if you're interested in a specific idea and you don't know how to do it to um, let me know. I, I really enjoy making these videos because they give me an opportunity to practice how I deliver ideas. Um, also, sometimes people ask me for stuff that I don't know how to do and it makes me have to go and look up things. It's always fun learning new stuff. Okay, so let's dive in. In this video, we're going to look at counted loops, and specifically one called a for loop. A for loop is really useful when you know how many times a loop has to execute. And it has a general structure such as this. It's for, and then the first part is the initialization. So what we do is we create some of a variable to keep a count. And the very first time it comes into the for loop, it's going to initialize that variable. The next piece for the for loop is the condition. This is the condition it checks at the end of the loop. If the condition is, is true, it continues. If it's false, it moves on. And then finally, the change. If we don't change the, the variable that's being checked, then the loop will never exit. So the change occurs at the end of each at the end of each time, sorry, the, the change occurs each time the loop ends. So if we look at this little example here in green, um, we've declared an integer called i, and we've set it equal to zero. That's our initialization moment. Our condition is it will repeat as long as i is less than 10. And at the end of each loop, we increment i by one. So the very first time it gets to this loop, it sets i to zero. And then it checks, is i less than 10? Definitely. Executes the code block, and when it gets to the end, it increases i by 1, so i becomes 1. Is 1 less than 10? Definitely. So it goes back up to the top and does it again. So with this in mind, let's write a little program where we use one. So this program will take five numbers from the user and add them together. So the first thing we need to do is to set up our program to take the to take an input and it have a variable to store the total in. So I'm going to declare a scanner object s. Again, we haven't really explored what the scanner class is. What we said right now in our classes is that a class is like a toolbox and it has a whole bunch of pre-written code you can take advantage of. The scanner class has this wonderful tool which allows us to take inputs from the keyboard. So we're going to have an integer called num, which we'll set to zero initially. This is going to be the value that the computer that stores the keyboard input. And we're going to have a variable called total. And we're going to set the total to zero equal initially. So I'm going to say system.out.print input number. And then I'm going to increase. I'm going to say num is equal to s dot next int. And then once I've taken that value, I have to say total is equal to total plus num. Remember, this is called a self-referencing assignment statement. When we look at an assignment statement, we completely ignore the left-hand side. We start by looking at the right-hand side, and we say, okay, what is total? And so whatever value total has, it will add that to num. And then once we've evaluated the right-hand side, whatever value it calculates gets put into the variable on the left-hand side. So then, of course, at the end, we want to output the total is total. And I can run this now, and it's nothing fancy. I can input a number, and I put a 5, and the total is 5. Great. But we want this program to take five numbers. Now I could very easily take this code here and cut and paste it five times. Why don't we do that? One, two, three, four, five. So now if I run it, I can do one, two, three, four, five, and I get a total of 15. Perfect. What would happen though if I wanted to take 500 numbers? you're not going to want to cut and paste this 500 times and anyone reading this code will become rather tired of it very quickly. So with that in mind, we're going to use a loop structure 
to make this run a little more smooth like. So the first question I ask myself is, can I count the number of times that I want this, the code block or the loop block to execute? And the answer is yes. I want it to repeat five times. So that means these three lines are what need to appear inside my loop block. So I'm going to put a brace here and a brace here, and I will indent them. And since I can count the number of times that I, that I want to take an input, I'm going to use a counted loop, and in this case, a for loop. I'm going to say for. And then the first question says, first part of a for loop is the initialization. So I'm going to initialize an integer, call it i, and set it to 0. This is one of the few times that we initialize a variable in a location other than the very top of the program. Whenever I'm working with beginning programmers, I always say, all your variable initialization should occur at the top. And that's the reason for that is because we haven't explored a concept called scope. I encourage you to go look that up. I'm not going to talk too much about it right now. Um, but it is an important concept as you move forward. The one difference about this variable compared to all other variables in this program is that i only exists inside of the loop. So if I try and access i outside of the loop code block, it's not going to know about it. OK, the next part of the for loop. I need my condition. Well, I want to continue to do this as long as i is less than 5. Because what that means is that i will initially be 0, and then it will go 1, 2, 3, 4. But as soon as i becomes 5, it's not going to execute the loop again. And now I want to set my change. I like to space these out like this. Now my change is every time I'm going to increase i by 1. So I'll write a self-referencing assignment statement. And that's an assignment statement where the variable that is storing the result is actually on the right-hand side. And I say i is equal to i plus 1. Now, something to note here, there's all sorts of shorthands for incrementing variables as well as decreasing variables. Again, great things to look up and try and implement, but be wary around them, especially as a beginning programmer, because some of them do some funny things. For for loops, you don't have to worry too much, but in some other cases, your programs can start to have some odd behaviors. Um, and when I'm working with students and I'm looking through their code, one of the first things they'll do is if they're using those shorthands, I'll remove them all and, and put in um, the longhand version. And often that will solve some problem that they have. So it's a good trick when you're trying to debug your own code. And trust me, you will spend hours trying to debug code. All right. So let's just talk about how this executes before we actually run this program. The program's going to run. It's going to declare a scanner object. It's going to set num to 0. It's going to declare a variable total and set it to 0. And then it's going to hit this loop. The very first time it hits the for loop, it simply initializes the variable and checks the condition. So it initializes i to 0. And then it will say, is i less than 5? And the answer is yes. So it goes in and executes the loop. So we output input number, we input a number, and then it adds the number to the value of total. So then it gets to the end of the loop, and again we can comment here to help us remember we can take this for loop statement at the top, and we can paste it here, um, and now I know exactly what this brace is associated with. So then it gets to the bottom and it's going to increment i, so i will go from 0 to 1, and then it will say, is 1 less than 5? And the answer is yes, so it comes back to the top and executes it again. One of the tricky things with loops is getting the math right. Often students will do things like this, and it will only run four times. That comes with just some practice, and sometimes having someone else look at your code will help you solve some of those problems. So if I run this, input a number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and the total is 15. I'm going to include a video about common errors that we run into, but I'm going to take a moment and show you one here. Notice, the while loop and the for loop are one of the few places we don't put a semicolon at the end of the line. However, if I put one here, 
I don't get an error. But watch what happens when I run it. Input a number, one, and it jumps right to the end. By putting a semicolon at the end, what I've done is I've told the computer that the for loop has no code associated with it. So it views this part as a completely separate structure and it only executes it once. So if you're having funny behaviors, one of the first things check to check for if you have for loops is to check if you accidentally put a semicolon here. I hope this video helped.